مولانا ابي القاسم محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين الله سبحانه وتعالى in whose name I begin and all praise belongs to him for giving us this life and for giving us the opportunity to represent him on this earth as khulafa as you know Allah has placed khalifa of the highest kind which are the prophets and the aimma and then he has kept the ulama under them and then the general people Allah in Surah Al-Hajj verse number 78 which I promise I will recite is a profound verse in the Quran and tonight being my last lecture uh, in these nights of series uh, I'd like to sort of summarize and conclude to the best of my abilities to put together the general vision so that when we walk away from these blessed months we feel like it wasn't recycled Islam but rather it was progressive Islam the type that made us want to do something and to be a part of the solution because if we're not then we are the problem Allah says وَجَاهِدُ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ وَاجْتَبَاكُمْ وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ مِلَّةَ أَبِيكُمْ إِبْرَاهِيمُ هُوَ سَمَّاكُمُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِ وَفِي هَذَا لِيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْكُمْ وَتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ فَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِاللَّهِ هُوَ مَوْلَاكُمْ فَنِعْمَ الْمَوْلَى وَنِعْمَ النَّصِيرُ صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوة الله محمد وعلى محمد Allah says, strive hard in the way of Allah. Wajahidu, haqqa jihadi. Strive. Striving is the best thing we can do in life because it's an indicator that Allah created us on this earth to struggle. Struggling is healthy. Striving is healthy. It keeps us healthy. When you see people in the gym and they're working out and they're sweating and they're breaking a sweat either on the treadmill or lifting weights, the result shows the body becomes lean, they look healthy, they live longer usually, and they have less problems. Even psychologically, you get more relaxed and relieved. Striving is good. Allah says, a striving that is due to Him, meaning that how do I know how much should I strive for Allah? How much do I know what I should do to strive towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What is the quantity of my striving? Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ See, my prayer, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي, my sacrifice. You see, وَمَمَاتِي, right? My, my living, my life, my sacrifice, and my death is all for Allah. Meaning there is nothing that is not for Allah. And if we realize how merciful Allah is, and we take into account that he has indeed blessed us and continues to bless us, then we will realize that we have to give ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because not that Allah needs it, by the way. Allah says, In Allah shtara min al mu'minin anfusahum. Allah has purchased from the believers themselves. What does it mean, purchase? The implication is that we reciprocate, though we cannot reciprocate, we can never give anything back to Allah. The mercy of Allah is so immense that when we look around, we say, how do I know to give this striving towards Allah? And one general way to look at it is to say, what do I want? What do I want for myself? I say, I want to be happy. I want to be good. I want to be happy. I want to live forever. And I want to live in a state of eternal bliss forever. And I know my eyes and my body has been fine-tuned to look at beautiful things. That when something beautiful passes by, I know I like to look at it. And I want it. And if I can see something magnificent, my heart tells me I wish I could own it. I wish I could possess it. It's natural, human nature. And it's nothing wrong to have this desire. These desires are fine. For us to want paradise, to covet beautiful things, is not haram. 
But why do we covet it? For what reason is the question? And material things will satisfy us temporarily, but there's nothing greater than spiritual satisfaction where your proximity to the one who makes everything beautiful. And this is why love of Allah, حب الله, قل إن كنتم تحبون الله فاتبعوني يحببكم الله ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم. Allah says, you claim to love me, then obey the Prophet. Then God will love you. So the standard of Allah's love is obedience to the Holy Prophet. Because then Allah will love you and forgive you and protect your sins from sins. So when I love something beautiful, Allah says, I made that. Allah says, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنَ الْخَالِقِينَ Blessed is he who makes everything good, who, who creates everything good. So when we look around, and particularly ourselves, when people say to me, brother, show me a miracle, I say, look in the mirror. You are a miracle. Because you were not existing before. And now you are there. And you came as a little speck in the womb of your mother. Now you're bigger than your mother. How is that possible? Right? You were a tiny little piece of lump of flesh in the, in the veils of your mother's womb. And now you are bigger than her. That's a miracle. And how can you answer where you came from? That's a miracle. How can anyone answer existence from non-existence other than miraculous events and the mercy of the one who is the ever-living? This is logical. Believe me, you can cut this a thousand ways. Even atheists who try to negate Allah, they have projections. They have the will to continue to exist. Yet they want to belittle the source of it. It's an irony. But those who belittle it is because they haven't taken account. And their account is skewed. Just like Einstein says, the universe is perfect. What we see as imperfections are our ignorance. The artifacts we see in the universe is, an, is our, our misinterpretation. He says, God is not playing dice with us. God has created a perfect system. Look around, Allah says, you know. Uh, Allah says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ تِبَاقًا مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْقِ الرَّحْمَانِ مِنْ تَفَاوْتِ فَرْجِعِ الْبَصَرِ هَلْ تَرَى مِنْ فُطُورِ ثُمَّ ارْجِعِ الْبَصَرِ قَرَّتَيْنِ يَنْقَلِبْ إِلَيْكَ الْبَصَرُ خَاسِئًا وَحَسِيرٌ وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّا السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِيحَ وَجَعَلْنَاهَا رُجُومًا لِلشَّيَاطِينَ Look at the verse in Surah Al-Mulk. Allah says, we made seven heavens, one on top of the other, layers, one on top, but you do not see cracks between them. مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْقِ الرَّحْمَانِ مِنْ تَفَاوُتْ Then Allah says, فَرْجِعِ الْبَصَرِ Go look at it again, return and look at it. Then Allah says, هَلْ تَرَى مِنْ فُطُورِ do you see a crack in the universe? Hal taramin futur? Thummarji al basar. Then go again. Go again and look at it. You will become tired and dazzled by this spectacular universe. Karrataniyan qalib ilayk al basaru. Khasiyan wa wahasir. Indeed, we adorn the lower heavens with lamps and we have made it as a protection from shayateen. Here, this lower canopy, which is our atmosphere prevents meteors from coming into the earth and striking us. As you know, there are space matters that are traveling at various, in various directions and speeds, and they penetrate the earth. When we see falling stars, by the way, stars don't fall. What we see is not a falling star, it's actually a meteor entering the atmosphere and is getting burnt. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam has told us, Allahumma Salli Ala Muhammadin Wa Ala Muhammad. He's told us when you see that, read Salawat. Do dhikr of Allah. Read Salawat because that is Allah's mercy. See? وَجَعَلْنَاهَا رُجُومًا shayateen. Shayateen here is that. Harmful things that will harm you when it's entering the canopy. But we made it elegant. That at night when we see this starry sky where there are no lights and it's crystal clear, it is the most pleasant vision to look at. I've had those situations at camp when we run our camps at night because the lights are off and we're on the fields and we sit and we gaze at the stars. We've had those days where you could literally touch the Milky Way. It's that close. It's so magnificent. It's so elegant. You can't stop looking at it.
The kids would take the pillows and just lie down and they don't want to blink. They are so in love, simply looking at the stars. That's the Rahmah of Allah. Salawatana Muhammad wa al Muhammad. So Allah has made seven heavens. Said, look at them. Scientists who write, astrophysicists say, when we look at the universe, we become tired and dazzled. Scientists have written this in their memoirs. We become dazzled and tired. And yet there's continuity in this universe. One layer upon another. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing it. Do you think this can all come by chance? When you look at the universe, look at us. Look at just between my brother, respected brother, was telling me about the hemoglobin. 4,000 molecules that maintain just the connection of oxygen. And if it doesn't work, it leads to sickle cell anemia. Where your cell becomes sickled. And you have enormous pain and difficulty to the end where you die an early death. Just a little thing like hemoglobin, which carries oxygen, how essential it is in a cell to carry oxygen to the rest of the body to give us the energy and to be able to do what we're doing. How little we appreciate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when we understand the nuances, as, a, as the Messenger said, man arafa nafsaw faqad arafa rabba. When you know yourself, you will know your Lord. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So, the Rahmah, what is this Rahmah? Let me give you, say, how much should I give back to Allah? The jihad that Allah deserves, how much? You know, the rule is, when you go to somebody and you say to them, I like you, and I want to give you a gift. So the person says, thank you. What's the gift for? Usually we have strings attached, you know, give a gift so you can get it back someplace else, double. <laughs> What's the string? The person says, no strings attached. Then why are you giving it to me? He says, because I like you. I am blessed to be next to you. Oh, like the other day, you know, every time, subhanAllah, I sit here, I see these little kids, my little brothers, there's a brother and a sister who always make these sweets and they bring it to me, you know, their father is sitting there. SubhanAllah, they come with a big smile and they say, here, we brought this for you. You know, you just want to hug them. No strings attached. They're just happy that you're next to them. And in your heart, you say, my God, I can't pay them back. I cannot pay them back. SubhanAllah. Just a little courtesy that goes, you know, that a person puts their hand forward in mercy to give you something. All of us should be charitable. In this charity here is not the kind where a person is in need, but just the kindness, the desire to want to share. This is jihad too, by the way. And the rule is that when somebody gives you something, let's say a person comes and says, I want to give you $100. $100. Says, for what? It's just a gift. Keep it. Any strings attached? Do you need anything? Should I work it someplace? You want me to wash dishes? <laughs> Guy says, No. I just like you. Thank you very much. I don't even remember that I gave you. Now you want to reciprocate, meaning you want to pay back this person. How much do you think it'll take to reciprocate? $100? $1,000? Million dollars? You might say this is ridiculous. $100 to a million dollars? If you gave the whole universe, you can't pay the person back. How come? He says, it's only $100. It's not about the $100. It's the fact that he initiated the goodness. And you are simply reacting to the initiation. Therefore, no matter what you give, is simply a reaction. This is why when we say, Assalamu alaikum, so much barakah. Alaikum salam is wajib upon us if we're bulug. But the, the, the reward is much less than the one who initiates Assalamu alaikum. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala initiated all good. Any good I do is because of a reaction of Allah's start. He is the originator of all good. And any good I do is simply a, 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 a wave reaction to his origination. I do not originate good in the holistic sense of the word. I do not originate the good. Even Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salatu wa salam, salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. He says, oh Allah, thank you for giving me this tongue to be able to thank you. 
But then, oh Allah, thank you for giving me the power to say thank you for giving me this tongue to thank you. But oh Allah, I am going to continue infinitely to say this because the more I realize it, I cannot stop but to thank you for giving me the opportunity to thank you infinitely. See, that's rahmah. Now what do you do? You stand up and you are grateful. And now you want to struggle that when you say Qulina salati wa nusuki wa mahiyaya, it's no longer just words, it's real. You are so in love with your Lord that you are ready to give your soul a thousand times. Like those in Karbala. You see, Muslim Ibn Awsaj says, if we come back and we're burnt and chopped a thousand times, we will not stop representing you, Ya Abu Abdullah al-Hussein. We will not stop representing you in Karbala or anywhere because Allah has blessed us with your leadership. You see, Abbas alayhi salam says the same thing when he says to Shemr al Joshan, who writes him a letter and says, I give you exit, you and your three brothers can leave. He takes the letter and rips it, steps on, his, on it and he says, how dare you want to butcher the representative of Allah, the grandson of the Prophet, the beloved of the Prophet and you give me exit? thousand times I will never do this. Ever. Because salati wa nusuki, we're in love. See Allah says, these men rijalun la tulhihim tijaratun wa la bay'un an dhikrillah. They do not trade any price for the love of Allah. This love, brother, does not come, brothers and sisters, does not come easy. All of us have to struggle on a daily basis. That's why Allah says, wajahidu fillai haqqa jihadi. Keep struggling for the one that he deserves. Not the little, but lifelong, forever. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look, this creature, I gave him the chance to reject me. I gave him an opportunity to deny me. I even gave him the power to be destructive. But he has refused, and she has refused to do so. They have stood upright representing me on earth as my khulafa. This is why it's so important for you and I in this blessed month of Ramadan that we take heed from these kinds of verses and we make dua and we stand. Because I'll tell you, in the scope of the worldly matter, I don't care who comes up on this pulpit. It could be a scientist, could be a philosopher, could be a Christian, could be a Jew, could be a Buddhist, could be a Hindu. You cannot compare with what has just been stated. It cannot be refuted. I swear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you cannot refute these arguments. If we really are sincere, heart to heart, the gravitation of being, having gratitude, even when Barker asked me, how do you know God exists? I said, I, I exist. That's it. I am the proof that God exists. And the mere fact that we're discussing it is proof in itself. For if we didn't exist, there'd be no discussion. And from nothing comes nothing. I am something. Therefore, something must have made me. And that thing that made me is very, very powerful and intelligent because I am talking about it. And this is not coincidental. And we're discussing this. Even the atheist is discussing it. Why do you want to know? If you are such an aberration in, in, in the universe and you're just some you know, primordial soup that came out of pure chance, then why are you talking about it? Let's just go in pure chance and ignore all this. But you're curious too. You want to know. So why do you want to know? It's all on the basis of gratitude. And if you ever notice atheists, they typically will belittle the mercy of Allah. My body is not perfect. I'm sick. My mother died. My grandfather died. See, they'll belittle. What will they do? They will see the cup is half empty. Life is about perspectives and perceptions. That's all it is. If you examine the world, we gravitate and move on the basis of perceptions. If I give you some positive perception, your chemistry will change, your movement will change, you'll become progressive, you'll become proactive. If I switch the perceptions, and if you see it as negative, you'll start to feel somber and, and very depressed and start feeling like I'm a loser and you want to quit. Human nature, and we flip on both sides. I know I've been critical many times. Sometimes in gatherings, I'm critical about our progression in the community, about our progress as an ummah in the community. And some people say, oh, brother, you're very critical. You should be very positive thinking. I said, no, I am positive thinking. But from the Quranic perspective, I see that every once in a while, Allah cracks the whip in warning us for the losses that we will sustain if we do not rise to the occasion to be positive and proactive. But 
A believer sees that glass as half full all the time. And a believer is grateful. Hmm. You might say, why? Because the believer says, thank God you left the other half for me to fill it. You gave me something to do. Subhanallah. That's the power of perceptions. Same cup. Same exact cup that's filled, half. Person says this is half empty. They're seeing the emptiness. The reaction, you take the cup and you empty it. A believer sees it as half full. The reaction, you fill it. It's a change in perceptions. You find people who don't, who don't honor the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negate everything. And they're angry with everything. Why is there evil? Why is there death? Why is there pain? I debated one professor you know, at Wayne State. He says, what kind of a merciful God creates pain? I said, haven't you heard? No pain, no gain. <laughs> He says, yeah, but, I said, of course, there are extremities, and that's why we need to work to alleviate it. When we do palliative care in medicine, it's a methodology. Yeah, but what about in the past when those people suffered? I said, don't worry, there is a God who takes care of all the pain. And that pain has a gain, that even the oppressed will be rewarded. That's the mercy of Allah, such that when a person is rewarded on Judgment Day, if they didn't feel some pain, how would they appreciate the gratitude of God? You know and I know that if a child is raised with a golden spoon, and they are bereft of any kind of empathy and sympathy for pain, they become the most wretched people because they're disconnected. Like Marie Antoinette, when they came to her and said, people are dying, she said, let them eat cake. Right? Because she was disconnected from the people. She was not feeling the pain of the people. Whereas that pain is healthy. Otherwise, how do we know? Extremities are bad. But that's what we need to work to avoid. But I say to them, you hate the pain, don't you? He said, yes. I said, I do too. Isn't it great that the merciful God programmed us to hate it? God forbid if we loved it. Because there are people who are demented who like it. Mm. Then what do we do? He says, thank God, we are programmed to it. So let's aim towards it. Let's aim to remove this pain. And let's be progressive. And let's see the cup is half full. And let's fill it together in a progressive manner. But the difference between an atheist and a believer is like wisdom, as they say. A wise man thinks long term. A foolish man thinks short term. Atheists, with due respect, are short-term thinkers. Believers in God are long-term thinkers forever. So who is the wise one? Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Allah says struggle the way he deserves it so when I take account like this and I realize Allah you created me and I can never pay you back that means whatever I do for you forever I can't pay you back so let me enjoy doing it for you because you are so merciful that not only did you create me out of mercy but every breath I take is your mercy and every time you have done so many things that I have not even accounted for. Zahiratan wa batin, Allah says. Alam tara wa Allah sakhara lakum ma fi samawati wa ma fi al-ard. Wa asbagha alaykum ni'amahu zahiratan wa batin. Have you not taken account? Alam tara wa Allah. God has made the universe subservient to you. And he has given you so many gifts. Visible and invisible. Hidden and known. Zahiratan known wa batin. Unknown. How much we have given you, Allah says. So let's do, let's account in this blessed month. Every one of us here is blessed. And you and I are not a statistic. And we are not a probability. We are planned to be here. You might say, how? Did Allah predestine? Allah chose us because Allah says in the Quran, I choose some above others. Why? So that the ones who are chosen should help the ones who are not chosen because that transaction helps me fill the cup. There are 7.5 billion people. What is the probability of being in this town in a wealthy environment, tech industry, uh, valley, where some of the finest innovations in the world come from here? What is the probability you and I can have such, such a chance where we don't have to pick trash and to eat rotten food. And we don't have to worry about bombs dropping on our heads like right now it's happening in Palestine. Hmm? What is the probability? Allah is going to question us. You were chosen to come to this country. I know when I grew up in this country, I asked that question. I'm growing up in New York. Why did I not become a drug dealer? It's so easy. Why don't you become 
a wretched person. So easy. Oh Allah, what happened? I see people around me doing wrong. How come I'm not doing wrong? When my friends in university says, how come you're not dating? How come you're not drinking? How come you're not smoking? How come you're not snorting this weed, you know, this cocaine and stuff? I said, this stuff is all trash to me. This is low class stuff that you do. He says, how do you know this? Who taught you this? How come you're not so chasing these girls like all of us are doing? I said, no, they're attractive, but we have been taught the value of what the transactions will lead to. And our religion has taught us such values. We have the best role models. We're blessed. I tell you, extremely blessed. When I came home, I was crying. I said, Allah, you kept my parents intact. You kept my health intact. You gave me the power to get on a plane and to pay for my education with, through my parents. This is not something that just happens overnight. Allah says, On that day we will ask you, what did you do with my gifts? I gave you so many gifts, what did you do with it? I swear, every one of us here has to be thinking, not just to feed the refrigerator so it feeds us, and to have a nest egg so that we can leave an inheritance behind. No, that's just a part of the equation. What about the grander thing? What am I doing for my community? What am I doing to save our young generations? I'm critical on this issue and I'm saying it through this verse with the limited time I have. You know, we may be happy sitting here and says, Alhamdulillah, we're guided. Hmm? I'm scared. Because spiritual guidance, I'm rich. But I may be very stingy. I may be bakhil, and al bakhil Allah. One who's stingy is an enemy of Allah. And Allah may ask me on judgment, Hassanain, I gave you so much. How come you did so little? Huh? I gave you all these billions. You didn't give charity? You didn't share? Billions is a metaphor, of course. I don't have the billions. Billions in faith, in realizations, priceless. Did you share? Did you take that lost child on the street? Today I was listening to something that really hurt me. Just quick footnote, talking about this young African-American boy. This is classic. Unfortunately, our, our black population is under invisible slavery in the West. Honestly. Hmm? One out of every three black person is going to end up in prison. How is that possible? What's wrong with them? Nothing wrong with them. Our system pushes them there. Huh? 40%, 45% of prisons are, are being occupied by people of the black skin. How come? And we're taught, no, they're not smart. No, that's foolish. That's absurd. People, there's a group of people, and we have it innate in us, where we discriminate. That this poor little young boy, somebody called him a bad name, he got into a little fight. They took him to prison, and then he went to court. Finally, the judge threw out the case because it was a false accusation against him. But now he had to pay the court case. And he didn't have the money. And the poor guy now was being chased by the police. And finally, with the warrant, he goes to jail. And for the rest of his time now, he's going through the spinning system of prison. And once you go into prison, you become a felon. You can't vote. You cannot even enter public housing. You've lost all your opportunities, and if you apply for a job, they ask you the first question, have you ever been convicted of a felony? So you're done. Your life is finished. Deep down, I was, today I was listening to NPR, I was crying, I said, oh Allah, I wish I was there for this boy who was running away because he couldn't pay his court fees, that I wish there was a way I could have paid his court fees to change his life. And later on, this boy got into so many problems. Because of this problem, finally a bullet penetrated his head and he was pronounced dead as a teenager. This is classic. Do we care for such things? How about what's happening in the Middle East today? How many orphans are floating around? And how many homes are being removed at every time without any warning? When a bomb is going to drop, you've got 10 minutes to run to shelter. Imagine if we live that way. You know the tension and the aggravation? It would destroy us. This is the world we live in. We have to ask in this month of Ramadan, Oh Allah, what can I do? You might say, what do I do? Do I get on a plane and go there? No. Allah says, take care of your community. Alaykum anfusakum. Ya aman alaykum anfusakum. Take care of your people. Don't be satisfied that a couple of hundred people are coming. In your heart you say, there are hundreds, thousands of youth 
they are not coming here. There are lovers of Ahlul Bayt. They've been misguided. They don't have a place to connect. Do we give them some opportunities? Now, I'm not saying this community is not doing it. Mashallah, in my opinion, this community is far ahead of many communities. The mere fact that it's such a diverse community, such a growing community, such a beautiful facility, such intelligent people. I, I'm saying it heart to heart to this community that maybe you are the ones who are going to be the flag bearers of the future of our Ummah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. My time is running out quickly, but I'm going to end this. I mean, I'm going to try to connect. This verse, verse 78 of Surah Al-Hajj is profound. Please, I want us to reflect on it. Allah says, he has chosen you. Look what Allah says. Listen to the verse. Okay. وَجَاهَدُ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ هُوَ اجْتَبَاكُمْ وَمَا جَلَ عَلَيْهُ هُوَ اجْتَبَاكُمْ He has chosen you. Allah says, he has chosen you. Okay. وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجِ God has not made hardship in religion. He has not laid hardship. Religion removes hardship. إِنَّ صَلَاةَ تَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ Prayer keeps you away from wrongdoing and evil. It removes hardship. Fasting removes hardship. Generosity and sadaqah removes hardship. Zakat removes hardship. All of these remove hardship. The fact that we do not use foul language and we do not backbite and we do not find faults in each other, we remove hardship. The fact that our children should be born legitimately, we are removing hardship. The fact that we should earn halal living is removing hardship. Because the minute we do anything other than that, we put hardship on ourselves. We put undue burdens. Allah says, the faith of your father Ibrahim, he named you Muslims before and in this, that the messenger, listen to this verse. I'm not going to read the Arabic, I already read it. That the messenger may be a bearer of witness to you and you bearers of witness to the people. We're not spectators. We cannot sit on the side and say, Ya Imam Adrikni As-Sa'a. If you look at the history of every Imam, salam, every one of them, people say, Ya Imam Jafar Sadi, why don't you rise? He says, Where are you? Oh, we're with you. Imam says, Yeah, you're with me. He says, Yes, we're ready to go and stop Mansur Dawaniqi from all his treacheries. And the Banu Abbasid were now forming and the Banu Umayyad were falling apart. He says, you're ready? He says, yes, we're ready. Imam says, gather them. I want to see them. He says, and take a, a ram and put him on the roof. And don't tell anybody. So they put some, the man puts a ram on, you know, a goat up, up on the roof. Then everybody gathers. Imam says, now come with me. In front of the people, he takes him upstairs. He says, now slaughter this ram. So the ram is slaughtered and the blood is dripping on the side of the wall. Imam says, now go downstairs. <laughs> he goes downstairs, nobody was there. He said, what happened? She said, they got scared. They thought maybe you slaughtered them. Because the imam is going to call us. You think we're ready to stand? My brothers, I tell you, I say this to myself. You know what scares me the most? A person like Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wassalam. Was the most perfect human being after the Holy Prophet. How come he had such few friends? He held the hand of Kumail ibn Ziyad one time and says, come with me, Kumail. I cry when I listen, read this hadith. He says, oh, Kumail, preach to me. Kumail said, Amir al-Mu'mineen, you are the imam. You are the one who preaches. He says, no, no, I like to hear good talk about Allah. There were such few, such few. He says, preach to me. I want to hear haqq from you, oh, Kumail ibn Ziyad. Why? Because they were very lonely. They were the imams of the time. Why was his khilafah taken? Because the people didn't rise. People said, where are you? Did you, were you not witnesses in Ghadir? Didn't the Prophet say, Man kuntum mawla fahada aliyun mawla? People had amnesia. Oh yeah, but. Okay, Allah says, when you don't rise, your imam won't rise. It's the law. 124,000 prophets, same law. 12 imams, same law. Doesn't change. The imams say, we are here to lead. We have it all laid out. The leadership is in us. How many of you are ready to stand with us? This is the reason why imams suffer. Even Musa alayhi salam suffered for 40 years in the desert because the people didn't listen to Allah and therefore Allah told them now wander in the desert for 40 years. And poor man, he had to suffer also. Every prophet suffered because of the hands of the people. So I say to me, my imam is present in this world. I am worried. What am I doing? 
And I don't want to sound, you know, full of anxiety. I am blessed. But Allah is saying, have you sharpened your pencil? Are you efficient in time? I may take your soul tonight. Are you doing something right? I ask us all to think in these important nights. Allah says, I have chosen you. The Prophet is the witness over you. You are the witness over your people. What does it mean when you go to work, you and I? We should represent Islam. Don't be afraid. Don't change your names. Don't be scared. Although we, we change names sometimes out of fear. It's okay under taqiyya. It's all right. But in general, when we have strength, we should promote it. Let the person realize. I remember at the camp, when the workers would come, you know, and I would pay them right away. This is, wow, this is amazing. I mean, it's Friday. We just finished work. We're just handing in our hours and you're paying me. I said, my prophet told me to pay before the sweat dries. He said, which prophet is this? I said, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Wow, is that what your prophet says? I said, yeah. I cannot run a camp where I bring children and teach them what is wrong and right and cheat you. By what, by what virtue will I achieve through vice? By cheating you and robbing you. I will not take one dime out of the standard payments of that needs to be paid. Otherwise, I won't do it. And I hired you. You have earned it. You deserve to be paid. And I cannot delay it. It's not fair for me to delay your payment. This is your haq. This is your right. You can't believe these guys go around town talking. These are the nicest people. We've never seen such people. They gravitate towards Islam. They talk in their bars. Even when they gather together in their homes, they talk about this camp. They say, those are the Muslims. This is how they behave. Simple examples I give. It works. Same thing. Represent Islam. Don't be afraid. This is da'wah. Allah says, I sent you to America. I sent you among the people who are very good. They are misguided, many of them. Are you helping them to be guided? Salat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So what does Allah say in this ayah? Therefore keep a prayer. Pay the poor rate. Hold fast by Allah. He is your guardian. How excellent the guardian. How excellent the helper. Tonight I want to end. I've got about 10 minutes, 7 minutes left. I just want to say thank you very much for your kindness and your hospitality. Tonight I want to end as the brother who has sponsored and has made a notation and I sincerely, it's one of my favorite subjects is the love of parents and obedience to parents and the importance of maintaining their baraka. Look, I can't speak much on this subject too much because I get emotional many times, but I want to say, we talk about being appreciative to Allah, the hand through Allah that fed us and took care of us and kept up late at night and changed their vacation plans and their business plans to accommodate me as a child can never be paid. The messenger said, if you took your skin and you made it into shoes for your father and mother, you will not pay them back. Your skin, you cannot pay them back. Allah said, well, وَسَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ We have enjoined goodness on mankind, upon mankind, goodness to their parents. وَسَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنٍ وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَمَيْنِ أَنِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكِ The mother suffered pain upon pain for two years. Uh, be grateful, Allah says to me. Allah says, be grateful to me and to your parents. Anishkuli wali waliday. Look how beautiful this verse is. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, how much we have honored you as a human race through your parents. Even non-Muslims, when they tell me, I respect my mother, I respect my father, I said, I like you. I respect you. This is why do you respect me? I said, anybody who has the courage and the wisdom to appreciate their parents is an appreciative human being. Such a human being is gravitating towards the mercy of God. I don't care what religion you belong to. You have appreciation for the very hands that fed you, then that's the hand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely reward. The mother especially, brothers. There was a story of a man who was dying in Sakaratul Maut. And he wasn't dying. And they called the messenger. He says, oh messenger, this boy is dying. So he was in pain in the death pangs. And the Prophet said, where are his parents? He says, his mother has died. His father is alive. So he called the father. He says, why don't you forgive the son? He says, I am disappointed with my son. That is why I am not forgiving him. 
the prophet said first and foremost if only his mother was there for if she prayed for him he would have been quickly relieved from this pain he says but the father is good then the prophet looked at the father and says forgive him for he's struggling he's suffering forgive him forgiveness is good Silatul Raham, as they say make peace why is there a situation where a father is disappointed with the son they don't make friendship with them I see some parents don't talk with their children in a friendly manner they don't take them in in a congenial way they don't hug them I've seen children who get beaten by their fathers whipped by their fathers I talk to the father many times I see young children who come to camp I see bruise marks I said what's his bruise mark he said no I just fell I said you can't fall and make that bruise mark there is no way that bruise can come through fall somebody hit you the child says well in a nice way he says to me my father hits me I says do you like it he says no I love my father too much but he hits me he punishes me too much he hits me I look at him I have tears when I see that I said why is the father hitting this lovely child even if the child is rambunctious even if a child is wild the reason they're wild is because we're not talking to them right otherwise every child will submit every child on earth this ADHD problem it's because we have ignored our children we have not put the energy in our children properly we haven't put the focus the proper kind what, what I, mean, I mean is not the love that you're constantly kissing them every 30 seconds where we're spoiling them with toys no meaningful even three five minute talk how was it when a child is talking pay attention come to their level eye to eye don't look down at them sit with them bring them eye to eye and tell them you are important that's the healing moment children who flower children who grow children who do amazing things in life are the ones who receive the love from the house it's not about the toys it's not about the electronics children you go into electronics because they are being ignored if they're shown the real love this will be a distraction to them their love relationship will be so strong they'll be very social they will not suffer through bipolar characteristics there's much to say on this brothers my I'm saying this but me as a son I look I'm a father too I look at my parents I said I can never pay them back I was in the university I cried I said oh Allah no matter what I've done I can never pay my parents back I did a quick analysis I said, oh Allah how can I pay them back should I make a lot of money and buy them a palace should I carry them you can but it's not enough I said I would love on judgment day if Allah deems me worthy that I look at my parents and say oh Allah if there's any value to this it's because of them that to me would be monumental in life that every time I stand on this podium I pray to Allah my grandfathers my grandmothers my parents and all those great personalities great scholars like Shaheed Mutahari Shaheed Bakr Sadr Ayatollah Khomeini Rahmatullahi these great leaders who changed my life who woke me up Allama Taba Tabai, Rahmatullahi Alayhi. These people shaped my life. I said, Oh Allah, anything I'm saying, if it's good, it should be because of them. I'm just a conduit. So tonight, as we're doing this majlis, or we're doing this program, those who are sponsors, we say, Oh Allah, bring the barakah through them. That we're doing something good. When we give charity, we're upright, we help others, and we bring goodness. Their thawabajari continues to grow. Inshallah, it will continue to grow. Bi'ithnillah, inshallah. This is why it's extremely important. Even in the Quran, when Luqman is talking to his son, fathers, please, I say to us all, pay attention to our children. Give them good advice. Like the way Luqman gave advice to his son. Ya bunayya la tushrik billah inna shirka la dhulmun azim. Ya bunayya aqim as-salah wa amur bil-ma'roof wa anhani al-munkar wa asbir ala ma asabak. My son, uphold prayers. Promote good, forbid evil, and be patient with your trials. Don't turn your face away from people, and don't be arrogant. These are the kinds of guidances we need to give, and children need fatherly figures. They need strong figures in the house. Mothers play a huge role in infusing the spirit in the children. They are the nurturers, the ones children always go back to. This combination is what brings barakah in a family and brings greatness in societies. And when you see great people in society, you will see one or both parents infuse a tremendous amount of love in the child. All great personnel study them, you will see they had received this great amount of love. May Allah give us a tawfiq, inshallah. I was going to recite and end this from Saifa Sajjadi, Imam Zain al Abidin. One minute, if you don't mind. It should be ending now. Allah say, Imam Zain al Abidin, in Dua Makarim al Akhlaq. This dua, Imam Zain al Abidin, subhanallah, subhanallah, 
Every time I open this Sefer Sajjadiyah, the one thing that strikes me is you witness the decapitation of your father. You witness the butchery of your father. And you were taken as a slave, dragged city to city with chains. And you love me so much, oh Imam, I cannot pay you back. That while you were released, you wrote the Sahifa Sajjadiyah for me as a guidance, as a training, as a dua, as a formula to succeed. Allahu Akbar. I'll just read the English. Imam Zul Abidin says, Oh Allah, complete my intention through your gentleness. Fix my certainty through what is with you and set right what is corrupt in me through your power. Oh Allah, bless Muhammad and his household. Spare me the concerns which distract me. Employ me in that which you will ask me tomorrow and let me pass my days in that from which you have created me. Free me from need. Expand your provision towards me and tempt me not with ingratitude. Exalt me and afflict me not with pride. Make me worship you and corrupt not my worship with self-admiration. Let good flow out my hands upon the people and if Face it not by me making them feel obliged. Give me the highest moral traits and preserve me from vain glory. What a dua. Dua makarimul akhlaq. It's much longer. Just a little excerpt, a lesson in Islam, a university in Islam. I leave us all with this dua, inshallah. That please, in this blessed month of Ramadan, let's first and foremost, if we have any hatred with each other, fix it. Fix it. Immediately, make peace. Move away. Allah says, month of Rahmah, no hatred, no animosity. Be charitable, be loving, be giving, be forgiving. Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us much. May Allah give you the tawfiq. And I really sincerely want to thank you for your kindness. Sisters especially for struggling with me in uh, your silencing the children and in all the things that I may have said. And please forgive me if I stepped on any toes. It was not intentional. Wassalamu alaikum jamian wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.